Okay, folks. Well, good evening. Uh, <laughs> thumbs up, huh? Uh, yeah, we are recording, indeed. Um, okay. Um, this is Kabbalah Decoded, for those of you who didn't know where you are. <laughs> and uh, tonight's class is about the concept of three wells. The three wells that Isaac dug, that Yitzhak dug, which are called three dimensions of being. Now, if anyone wants to follow this, you can actually find it in um, Genesis, Breshit, Chav Vav, chapter 26. And um, from verse um, 19. In any event, you don't have to you, know, you don't have to follow inside. Uh, I'll just tell you what's going on. So, what happened was um, Yitzhak Isaac um, was now essentially the spiritual leader of the world. It was after the passing of Abraham, Abraham, and um, he had come to a place called Gerar. He was always living in the Holy Land, in the land of Israel. Uh, there'd been a famine, and um, he was about to move to, to Egypt to follow in his father's footsteps, who his footsteps who had also gone down to Egypt, but he was told that he shouldn't leave the country, but he should go to um, a place called Gerar, and there he would be able to um, survive the famine. In any event, he went to this place, and um, there was a leader, a king, um, named Avi Melech, who lived in that place. In any event, he um, he was uh, he was he was uh, sort of encamped in this place called Gerar, actually just a little bit outside Gerar, and uh, he dug a well. And the um, the well that he dug, he called, he gave it a name. They found, he said, it says that he dug the well and he found living water over there. Now, he called the well Essek. Why was it called Essek? Because he, the, uh, the um, shepherds, some of the shepherds of Gerar, of this place called Gerar, they would take their flocks out into the uh, fields, out into the wild, I guess, where it was that uh, Isaac Yitzhak was encamped, and they argued with him over the possession of the well. Even though he had dug the well, they claimed that it was on their territory, and uh, they argued about the well, and um, then they basically they took it from him. They, uh, he wasn't prepared to, uh, to fight for it, uh, so he, um, he left and he went to another place. Isaac left and went to another place, and the word Essek actually means quarrel, or Essek. Essek means a quarrel. So because they quarreled from it, he called the well, uh, the well of quarreling, essentially. Then he went on and he moved uh, to another place, and he dug another well, and uh, he called that second place Sitna. Sitna. And uh, unfortunately, they, um, the shepherds of Gerar, once again, argued with him about the possession, about the ownership of the well. And uh, they claimed that it was on their territory. And um, even though he had dug the well again, he decided not to, um, not to fight about it, but to move on. And he did a third time. He moved on. Again, dug a well a third time. And over this well, there was no arguments, there was no fights, no one, no one else claimed it. And he called this well Rehovot. Um, the previous well, Sitna, actually means to swerve aside or to, or to um, uh, either to swerve aside or to um, Discourage is not really the right word, but sitna, it, it's actually from the, some, from the same word as the word Satan, Satan. 
which means that there was a uh, kitrug, there was a um, some kind of um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, there was a um, something bad that was going on over there, something negative about it, something bad that uh, that could be said. All kitrug. And then we called the second well Sitna, but the third well he called Rehovot. Rehovot means wide open places. And over that there was no uh, there was no argument, and uh, that well remained uh, remained his well. Now, you could think like, what you know? What I have to know about this? Uh, these these things is just drink, digging wells. I mean, what, what of what importance is it, uh, is it to us? Of what importance is it that we find out about the wells that uh, Isaac was digging? What <laughs> what significance does this have for uh, future gener- generations? But in fact, uh, every incident that is recorded in the Torah is recorded that way because there is tremendous significance to it and teaches us, in fact, about certain approaches to life and things that we need to um, keep in mind and, um, in fact, how to bypass or overcome difficulties and um, arguments and issues that we all have to deal with in one way or another. So let's just look at it a little bit more uh, broadly. What is digging a well all about? Digging the well is is in order to get to, as the verse says, to get to Mayim Chaim, to get to living waters. In other words, to get to a source of life that is called living. Now, there's a difference between, um, first of all, the difference between a spring and a well. A spring of water is something that comes about naturally without the input of human beings. A spring is essentially a natural source of water that bubbles up from the ground and um, provides people with water. A well, on the other hand, is something that has to be dug. In other words, the water is there, but it's essentially not revealed until one digs down deep enough to be able to find it. I think I mentioned in the Sunday class that part of this whole concept of digging wells is the process of introspection and meditation and digging down into the wells of one's own soul, as we will uh, describe shortly. Now, when digging down into the well in order to find this water, the water that he found was called Mayim Chaim, living water. Now, what's the difference between living water and regular water? So, living water, the way it's explained in um, the way it's explained actually in uh, in the Talmud. The difference between living water and regular water is that living water is that water, first of all, that can be used for certain purification rites that regular water cannot be used for. For example, um, to purify a person from contact with the dead, so what was necessary was the ashes of the red heifer mixed with mayim chaim, with living water. Now, the Mishnah describes... Mishnah is part of the Talmud, um, the, the rudimentary form of the Talmud, the uh, basic principles of the Talmud is called Mishnah. So in the Mishnah, it describes the concept of Mayim Chaim, living water, and it says that living water is that water which is attached to a source and will not become detached from that source. Not even once in a long period of time period of time it uses is seven years. Water that is detached from the source, in other words, let's say water in a pond or a lake, which is not being fed by a spring or not being fed by a, uh, by a well, it's not attached to the original waters, and I'll explain that in a second, is not called living water. Now you could ask the question, when I look at the water, I take a cup of water from a regular well, that's, let's say, or from a regular pond, let's say, and I take water from a well, and 
if I look at the chemical composition, both of them are H2O, right? It's not going to make any uh, difference chemically what the, um, what the composition of this water is. Both of them are H2O. There's no difference between them. So why then is there a difference between pond water and what we call living water, water that's connected to a source? So let's just explain this concept of water that's connected to the source. The, um, um, what's it called in Hebrew? It's called a ma'arechet, the uh, system. The wa a water system is not just what you see on the surface. The system of water is, even if you see on a pond or a lake or whatever it is, if it is just surface water detached from its source, Again, that's not called living water. That's just water, but not living water. And it cannot be used, be used in certain purification rites. The difference is that water that's joined to the source is attached to what's called the Tohom Rabba, the water deep underneath the earth. There's water deep underneath the earth in a vast reservoir of water that's underneath the earth that is revealed essentially in a spring and the spring becomes a river and then the river flows down to the sea. That is the Marechet, the system, the water system essentially. Now, all of these have their adjuncts and their parallels in uh, Kabbalistic understanding. The water deep underneath the earth, the great reservoir of water, which is called the Tahom Rabbah, the great vast underwater story, uh, under earth storage chamber of water. There's waters, uh, chambers of water or, uh, or vast underground sort of uh, canyons of water underneath the earth. That is a, the adjunct of that, that's connected to the concept, to the uh, sphira, to the divine emanation called keter, keser. As the water comes out through channels in the earth and it spurts out in a spring, the adjunct of the spring, the concept of a spring is essentially chokhmah, the sphira of chokhmah. Keter is the primary source, but it's hidden from us. Chochmah is the first revealed source, the spring. Then the spring gathers together, the water as it comes out of the spring gathers together, becomes a trickle, and then the trickle is joined um, by, by, by more and more water coming out of the earth, and that eventually becomes a river, and it, 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 the river goes down to the sea. The river going down to the sea, the river is called, is the adjunct of Bina, the sphere of Bina. And ultimately these go down to the sea, and the sea is Malchut. And from Malchut, Malchus, the water goes back underneath the earth, seeps down through again and comes out again. Uh, into the Tom Rabbah, which comes out again as a as a as a Mayan as Chokhmah. So it goes again, Malchus goes back to Keter, and then Chokhmah and Bina and so it goes around. And that is the now water that it's that's attached to the source, to the Tahom Rabbah, that is called living water. So it is a very important function. This living water itself has a very important function in terms of its being attached to the ultimate source of energy, of power, of life. That's why it's called living waters. Keter is a sphira that is representative of the will of God. What he wants, what he created this creation around us for. What we are here for, what the world is here for, what the ultimate purpose of things is what Keter represents. So when we, when we attach to that, we're part of what we could be called the living waters. We're alive. We're alive. Now, 
in various Kabbalistic um, works, they explain these three wells, the first two of which there was an argument about who owns it, who possesses them, and the third one there was no argument about. The Ramban, Nachmanides, the Ramban explains that these represent the three temples. I'm not going to go into that now. I'm going to give it somewhat of a different explanation. But you could keep that in mind to be able to connect it up to what the three temples were. The first temple, built by Solomon. The second temple, uh, which was uh, built and then rebuilt by Ezra. And ultimately, the third temple, which will be, will, will be rebuilt by the Messiah of Mashiach, uh, that's yet to come. And the final one, there's no argument about. The first two were destroyed. The first one was destroyed by the Babylonians. The second one was destroyed by the Romans. And the third one will never be destroyed. <clears throat> so, however, in Kabbalah, they don't focus so much on the three temples, but they focus on three dimensions of existence, three dimensions of being. The first dimension of being is called Hishtoshalut. Hishtoshalut means the chaining down of the worlds, how the worlds, how reality comes into being. Whether we're talking about physical reality or we're talking about the more spiritual reality. As everybody knows, there are various planes of existence. There are planes of existence which are called the worlds in Kabbalah. Generally, we talk about five worlds, although the highest world, Adam Kadmon, is somewhat esoteric and is spoken about far less than the other four. The other four worlds are Atzilut, then the next world down, Bria, and then Yetzira, the world of formation, and Asiya, the world of action. So it goes Adam Kadmon, the primordial world, the world of Atzilut, the world of closeness, Bria, which is the world of creation, of coming into being, into physical being, the world of Yetzira formation, and the world of Asiya, the world of action. As regards all of these worlds, even though there are some very, very lofty and very high, spiritual, high-level worlds over there, Anam Kadmon and Atzilus, Nevertheless, they all are all worlds. Now, the word world in Hebrew um, is olam. Olam is, a, uh, is related to the word he'elem. He'elem means concealment. Because the world in one way or another, even the highest of the worlds, only comes about due to the concealment of godliness. So, when godliness becomes concealed, then the world becomes revealed. The more the godliness is concealed, the more physicalized the world is. The more material the world becomes. Until we get to the world of Asiya, which the, the lowest level of the world of Asiya is this physical world that we see around us. When I say, when I say this physical world, it doesn't mean only the earth, it means the entire physical universe. Vast though it may be, is nevertheless the most hiddenness of godliness. But because of the hiddenness, because there is hiddenness in the world, or well, the world itself represents the concept of hiddenness, even the higher worlds, although godliness is much more revealed there, therefore there can be, so to speak, opposition. There can be a claim by the shepherds of Gerar, shepherds of Gerar do not represent holiness, they represent the opposite of holiness. They can claim that the worlds belong to us. Physical reality and even spiritual reality behind the physical reality doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to you, Isaac, it belongs to us. We are laying claim to that we were here first. Isaac is not willing to fight in the initial um, 
and in the initial well, the first well that he dug, he is not willing to fight, and therefore he calls it, he calls the well Esek, quarreling, Esek. It's something that can be quarreled over, and if it's claimed by the other side, if it's claimed by unholiness, I'm going to relinquish my claim to that particular aspect of reality. There's a deeper aspect of reality, which is not only the worlds, but the interaction within the worlds of the interactions between the Svirot. The interactions, in other words, of the various lights with the vessels. Now, without getting too complicated here, lights in the vessels form um, clusters called partsufim. Pratsuf really means a, a, a countenance or a face. But what it represents essentially is the ability of clusters of Svirot to interact with each other within each dimension of the world. So, within the interaction of the Svirot themselves, um, these clusters of Svirot, they form clusters which uh, interact in various ways, which are called, uh, in Kabbalah, they are called, they, 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 they define, sort of, so to speak, by, by human relationships. So Chochmah, for example, the Sfirah of Chochmah is called Abba. The Sfirah of Bina is called Ima. Abba and Ima means mother and father. Because they act in similar ways to those human qualities of mother and father. In other words, the mother and father get together, they unite, and then produce children. They produce the lowest Svirot. So the highest Svirot couple, so to speak, and produce the lowest Svirot, Zer Anpin and Malchut. And Zer Anpin and Malchut, Zer Anpin, sometimes called Ben, the son, Malchut, the daughter, and they also interact, they interact with the parents, so to speak, with Abba and Ima, with mother and father, and they interact with each other as well, and they also produce various interactions. These interactions are produced by, they produce through prayer, they are produced through meditation, and they produced also by fulfilling the commandments and by doing good by doing good deeds and fulfilling the commandments. That's how the Svirot couple and then they bring forth new light, new energy, new vitality into the world. The second uh, well was also a subject of dispute. Again, the shepherds of Gerar argued that they belong to us. This is our property. In other words, we have some kind of command. Uh, I think unpaid and grandfather, yeah, you could say that to a certain extent, right. The Pratsufim are countenances in other words, clusters of spherot that operate in a certain interactive way with other spherot. That's what's called a parts of. Um, I'm not sure. Sorry, Yal, I didn't see your notes before. Please spell which word. I'm not sure. Training down to reality would be hishtal shalut. H i s h t e l hishtal shalut. S h e l u t hishtal shalut. Okay, so. They argued about the second well as well, and that therefore it was called Sitna. It was called, um, I can't think of the English word, um, it's like Sitna is like a complaint, like a gripe, a gripe or a complaint or a, um, um, well, something that's negative that is said about uh, about somebody or about something. So that's called sitna. It's also to swerve aside, to 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 um, 
make the main purpose not the main purpose anymore, to cause things to go off the track. That's what the word Satan, Satan from Satan in, in English, is someone, is, is, is that concept, that energy, which takes a person off the path that he should be traveling on, causing to swerve aside or to, to go off the path. So they call that, he called that well, Sitna. Because there was a, um, uh, a complaint, there was a kitrug, there was a, um, I can't think of the English word, I'm forgetting English. <laughs> yeah, Sitna is hatred, yeah, it's, uh, hatred is, uh, yeah, yeah. It's definitely a related word. Um, right. But the third well was called Rehovot. What does the third well correspond to? So again, the first well corresponded to the descent of the world from higher to lower. That's called Hishtal Shalut. Uh, you know what? Let me just write it in the chat over here so you can see it. I'll write it in English so everyone can get it. The second well represents the concept of what's called hit, love, shoot. Hit, love, shoot. Hit, love, shoot. Hit, love, shoot means coupling or clothing or bringing together so that one thing meshes with the other. Hit, love, shoot. It's called the meshing of the interaction of the Svirot. So the first level, there was an argument about. Hit love shoot, there was also an argument about. The third level is called Hashra'a. Hashra'a. Hashra'a means the dwelling of godliness on and within. Sometimes it's translated as indwelling, but it's not quite right because it, at the same time as it dwells within, it envelops, it completely surrounds and encompasses and permeates at the same time that which it is revealed in. That really corresponds, that last level corresponds, Hashra'a corresponds essentially to the soul. Hashra'a also means inspiration of the soul. So the first level is developmental. The second level, is, which there was an argument about, the second level is interactional, and there's an argument about it. The third level is inspirational, and has to do with the soul, and on that there can't be an, an argument. There's no, there's no possibility to argue against a person's own awakening and inspiration and therefore intimate relation, a relationship with divinity, with God. So that resting and that indwelling and that permeating of that divine inspiration, the divine spirit of within a person could be called hashra'a. Okay. And again, about that, there was no, uh, there was no argument. So there's, therefore, there are three, there, there are really three dimensions of being. The first dimension of being is the outer world, the outer surface of things, where we look at the outside and we see only the outside, we see the outer appearance of things, understanding that there's a whole developmental process that's behind it, but all the way along that developmental process, there's a composite hiddenness. There's a compounding hiddenness. The further it comes towards us, the more tangible it becomes, the more in quotes, real it becomes in a physical sense, the more godliness is hidden within it. It is a manifestation of godliness, no question about it. But that godliness is mostly hidden from view. 
Therefore, Yitzhak, Isaac, tries to dig the well. In other words, he tries to reveal the living waters from within physical creation. He tries to be able to imbue his followers, his disciples, with the understanding that there is godliness within creation. And he teaches them how to dig the well. Unfortunately, that well becomes tainted. Others claim some kind of um, ownership or co-ownership of that, and therefore he kind of abandons that well. He doesn't want to continue with that path of revelation because the water that comes out of there even though the water is connected but when it comes to us that water that he digs up in other words the revelation that he finds within physical creation is somehow tainted by association with those who are not do not have pure intentions So in a sense, he leaves that meditation. The whole concept of digging wells, again, as we said before, was a type of meditation, a deep meditation that reveals living waters. So he goes to the next level. The next level is in the interaction of the Svirot. In the interaction of the Svirot, when two parts of him, two clusters, interact, they automatically bring upon themselves a third aspect, which is higher than both of them. For two things to enmesh, to become, to become inter-enclosed or inter intermeshed one with the other, that brings down a greater light. I'll give you an example of this. The, um, the idea of a bride and a groom, in Jewish tradition, when a bride and groom get married, so they get married outdoors. But above them is this canopy. It's canopy up on poles. It's usually not a fixed canopy. It's a canopy which, uh, which, which is held by four men usually, uh, or boys holding the, uh, holding the poles of the canopy to hold it up above the, the, uh, the chosan and the color, the bride and the groom. And that represents the idea that the mother and father, in other words, the bride and groom who are going to become mother and father, each donate towards this relationship some aspect of themselves. But in order for them to produce new life, so they need this canopy above them, in other words, they need to be able to draw down from the power of God into the relationship. That is why the Talmud, when explaining the... Uh, three partners in, the, in producing a child, in producing a baby, the Talmud says there are three partners. There's the mother, there's the father, and there's God. The mother and father give the physical components. Um, the way the Talmud puts it is that the mother gives the flesh and the blood, the father gives the bones and the nerves and the brain, and God gives the soul. He gives the life force. Similarly, when there's an interaction of the Sfirot, that draws down a certain amount of revelation from above. But nevertheless, as we all know, whenever there's relationships, there's always a possibility of uh, domestic dis-ease, let's put it that way. In other words... Um, sometimes the partners disagree about things. Certain uh, things can sort of come between them and cause them to be uh, disharmonious. That disharmony refers to the second well, which the, which the um, shepherds of Gerar argued about, and that's why he calls the well Sitna. They're both swerving aside and not, so to speak, facing each other and intermeshing. Each one goes their separate way, they're back to back instead of being face to face. That's called sitna. 
But the third well that he digs, the third aspect of meditation is not in the interaction of the two parts of him in order to draw down godliness into the world, but it's a meditation on the essence of the soul as it is bound up with God. The holy soul that we possess is called Mal, part of God above. And that part of God above is not, it's not possible for it to become tainted, to become impure, to become dislodged or, um, or, or detached from its original source. That's why it's called Rechovot. Rechovot means wide open spaces. And what does Isaac say when they dug the well called Rechovot? when they finally f found the well called Rechovot, in other words, where the revelation of godliness is an essential part, and not just sort of an addition to, but an essential part of the experience, this meditative experience, this, this third well, this third digging deep down into the psyche, into the, into the soul. So Isaac says there, Ki Hashem lanu farinu it's now God has widened up our scope, and we can reproduce in the land. We can be fruitful in the land. That fruitfulness is a result of finding the living waters that cannot be tainted, finding the essence of the soul, contacting the essence of the soul through this digging deep into that aspect of reality, the soul aspect of reality. So again, there's the physical aspect of reality, there's the interactive aspect which draws down a certain higher level of godliness into things because there's interaction and therefore we're able to give birth to positive things but even in this there is a possibility of becoming tainted but when we're talking about the third level the level of soul then there's no possibility of becoming tainted and there's no arguments about that well and now we're able to do what it is that we have to do to be fruitful and to multiply in the land. That was the third well. All right. Any questions? Need to listen to it again, huh? <laughs> uh, there's a private message here from somebody. Uh, they need to listen again. That's, uh-huh. So, um, okay, um, for most of you, I think it actually records on your own computer. You'll find probably a file on your computer called Zoom, but if you don't, it's going to be up on, um, uh, yeah, you'll find a file called Zoom and then it's recorded by dates. But if you don't, then um, you will find it on the website, kamaladecoded.com. Just go to the video tab, and it should be up there in about an hour after the class finishes. Let's say an hour and a half after the class finishes, you'll be able to find it there. Any other questions?